my soul. And all the wrong has to be blessed in so many. Bless the Lord, who my soul. And all that has been blessed in so many. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Once again, it's Wednesday evening. It's time for our Wednesday evening Bible study. If you will look, please, ma'am, please, sir, get your pens, your papers, pads, and your Bibles. And we're going to share in the Word of God on tonight. Uh, we're going to continue with dealing with the miracles of Jesus Christ. Tonight, we're going to look at the tenth miracle of Jesus Christ. This is when Jesus deals with a man with a withered hand inside of the synagogue. Uh, now, we know very little about this man. We don't know what caused him to have a withered hand. Uh, from Hebrew history, uh, we learn a little bit about him from the perspective that they believe that he was a carpenter. He made his living with his hands and goes on and talk about him begging Jesus to do something about his condition and his situation. As I said, the word of prayer, I pray that we'll press on this evening with uh, what we're going to share in Matthew's chapter 12. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to come into your house and thank you for the opportunity, Father, to come and to share in your word on tonight. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds that we'll be able to receive from you. Holy Spirit, we invite you in. We Teach and minister how you choose to teach and minister. We ask Holy Spirit after your teaching and after your ministry that we will have grown spirit, that with our eyes we have been opened, Father, we will see more than we've ever seen before. And Father, you will be glorified as a result of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, tonight we're going to go in back into Matthew chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 9 and verse number 14, and we're going to share in this text together. There are seven things that I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about Jesus when he made his departure and dealing with verse 9 and verse 10 and, and extract the principles out of there that are relevant for us where we are right now. And I want to deal with two questions. You know, is man more important than religion or the Sabbath rules? That's in verse 10. I want to deal with the conflict with Jesus over religious belief and rules. That's also in verse number 10. Then I'm going to deal with the truth being illustrated, it's being demonstrated. And you'll see that in verse number 11. Then you deal with the truth being stated. In other words, uh, doing good for man supersedes religious rules. And you'll see that in verse number 12. Then you have the truth demonstrated. Man and his needs are are put before religious rules, which meaning man is greater. You see that in verse 13. And finally, this is tonight, we'll talk about the religious rule, the religious response to the miracle of Jesus, Jesus before in verse number 14. And, 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 and tonight, we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, and let's read verse 9 and verse 10. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man with which had his hand with it. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Mm. Now, first, let's deal with the departure here in verse number nine. Now, this is not referring to Jesus leaving the Field where he had been just debating with the religious leaders. Now you can find that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, down to verse number 8 in this very same chapter. It means that he left the town that he was in for another town. It was on another Sabbath day that he entered their synagogue. Now you'll find that in Luke chapter 6, verse number 6, affirming that he entered into the synagogue. Now, Jesus in the synagogue is very, very important. Now, remember, note that this card, the speak in opposition, did not cause Jesus to withdraw from worshiping, nor prevent him from doing what he should be doing. I need you to hear this tonight. And 
I need you to get a good understanding of this. So let me say this again. Note that discord, disputes, and opposition did not cause Jesus to withdraw from worship nor prevent him from doing what he should do. This is a very important lesson for all of us to learn on tonight. Jesus was worshiping on the Sabbath day. He was where he belonged on the Lord's day. Conflict and discord should not cause us to forsake the Lord's house. Our first obligation is to love and worship the Lord with our whole being. Then you've got to understand this. He had just had an issue with the religious leaders and dealing with them. And he didn't get mad and run away saying, I ain't never going to the church ever again. Instead, the very next Sunday, he goes into the church and he begins to minister and teach the word of God just like always. He didn't let what happened in the church stop him from going to church. Look, let me help you. There are going to always be a point where people will disagree with each other in the church. And sometimes it is a very fervent and a fiery disagreement. But you don't let what you disagree about stop you from going to the church. A whole lot of people get mad because of a negative encounter in the church. And they leave the church because of a negative encounter. You've got to understand it is the devil's intention to keep you away from the house of God. And if you're going to live for God, you've got to understand that contentions will come up, disagreements will come up, arguments will happen, something you don't like will happen. It's just a normal part process of life. But the Bible says that you and I are to be able to resolve our disagreement. He says, come, let us reason together when we can lay flesh aside, lay pride aside, and go to the word of God and seek the word of God for a resolution for the disagreement, for the discord, for the argument, for whatever it is, rely upon the word of God to resolve it. And whatever the word says about it, the two of you need to agree upon that situation. It doesn't make sense for you to get angry, get upset, get mad, and leave the church, and then you blame the church for something that happened. Let me help you here. If you look, on your job, you're going to have discord. In your home, you're going to have it. Do you leave your home? Do you leave your job? Well, why would you leave the church? All right? Just want to emphasize that. Now, certainly Jesus noticed this man with the withered hand in the sanctuary. There's no doubt. There was no way that Jesus could be there and not notice this man. Now, either Jesus had his eyes on him or, or something, but the religious people from the sense that Jesus had compassion for this man. They sensed that Jesus was wanting to do something to this man to help this particular man's situation. And you got to understand the religious was disturbed deeply so far. Jesus was about to disregard their belief and savage rules again. This is also important for us to see here. The man was in the synagogue. He was a man whose who sense his desperate, his dependence upon God. Look, a physical handicap does not keep a person from being strong. A person can be handicapped and still be wonderfully strong. He can be strong spiritually and strong mentally, strong in confidence, strong in assurance, strong in a sense of God's presence. Strong in a sense of purpose and meaning. God can give this kind of, kind of strength to him. In fact, physical help is useless and sometimes destructive without the spiritual strength of God. This man with the, with the withered hand evidently knew God's strength, yet he had a deep need in his life. Two things that touched the Jesus' heart. The physical handicap can be used by God greatly. God uses handicaps to demonstrate great faith, to set a vivid, a vivid example of trust before loved ones, neighbors, and acquaintances. 
to be a dynamic testimony of God's saving grace, the cause of a person's own salvation, to draw a person ever so close to God in a very special way, to cause a person to become a, war, a prayer warrior, an intercessor for both God's people and for a world reeling from a restless and worrying spirit, lumps and trying to find its way in the world. So literally, Jesus went back to church. Jesus has to see and notice this man in the synagogue. Now let's read verse 10 again, and we'll move on to the second one. And behold, there was a man which had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Is a man more important than religion of the Sabbath day rule? Is he more important? Is a man more important than religion than Sabbath day rule? The law says that a person could not be healed or helped on the Sabbath day unless life itself was threatened. However, there sat the man and his dependency and his desperate needed condition. Jesus had the power to help him. But should he? If he healed the man, he would be breaking the Sabbath rule. Should Jesus put the man of the ritual first? There are some valuable lessons in this for you and I this evening. There are reasons why we put religion, custom, and presence order of things before man and the meeting of his needs. We slip into a routine, a way of doing things, and we must continue in it because it is something that is comfortable to you and I. We fear change lest we lose some people and their support. We fear the loss of position and security. We fear failure, the reaping of what we already have of losing the loyalty of others to our religion, religious position and practice. Every man has needs. He needs salvation, a true worship experience, a personal relationship with God day by day, a sense of spirits, the Spirit's presence and direction move moment by moment. He needs to know how to live in a world that pulls him away from God, a world that pulls him toward every worldly thing imaginable. Yet everything is too often put off before man. Maintaining the religious organization, the form, the ritual, the customs, the ceremonies, the service, the rules, the orders, and regulations, all seems to be more important than meeting man's needs. Nothing should keep us from meeting man's need, from putting him and his need first before all the religious rules and form. It is the only way the heart of man can be reached and satisfied. It is the only way the church can stop the loss of people who are being lost by the droves. As we have so often heard, they come in the front door and slip out the back door. Why are they doing that? Their needs are not being met. We need to be courageous and come before the Lord, searching our hearts and asking several questions. Are we really reaching that many people for Christ? Are people really accepting Christ through our ministry? Why not? When the Lord is it is when the Lord said the fields are white unto harvest, could it be we are stepped into religion? Seek into religion so much that we are putting religion before meeting the needs of the people. Man's basic need is to know and wish to God in a personal way. Yet too often we fall, we fail to reach out to men by putting worship, form, order, ritual, and rules before meeting his needs. Too often we act as though man exists for religion instead of religion existing for man. Too often we act as though man exists for worship service 
instead of worship service existing for man. Too often we act as though man exists for maintaining the organization instead of the organization existing for man. Too often we act as though man exists for the rules and, regular, and rituals instead of the rules and rituals existing for man. So we have to keep that in mind. People come first, before form, before religion, before customs, before tradition. Man come first. Now let's look at verse, verse 10 once again. And behold, there was a man with had his hand with it. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Now the religious conflict with Jesus over religious belief and rules. And now this was an ongoing situation. It, it was ongoing. I want to try and explain why there was much conflict with Jesus. But I'm not making an excuse for the religious. Just explaining the why behind this conflict. This conflict is something that thought by modern man to be petty and harsh, or else such conflicts are just not understood. Three facts will help us to understand why the conflict happened and were life-threatening, the ending, and the murder of Jesus Christ. The Jewish nation had been held, held together by their religious belief. Through the centuries, the Jewish people had been conquered by army after army, and by millions they had been deported and scattered over the world. Even in the day of Jesus, they were enslaved by Rome. Their religion was the binding force that kept Jews together in particular. Their belief that God had called them to a, des des a distinctive people who worshiped the only true and living God. Their rules governing the Sabbath day and the temple and intermarriage, worship, cleansing, and what foods they could and could not eat. This belief and their rules protected them from alien belief and from being swallowed up by other peoples through intermarriage. Their religion was what maintained their distinctiveness as a people and as a nation. Jewish leaders knew this. They knew that religion was the one binding force that held their nation together. Therefore, they oppose anyone or anything that threatens to break or weaken the laws of their religion and nation. The religious were men of deep, deep conviction. They were strong in their belief. Therefore, they became steep in religious belief and practice. To break any law or rule governing belief or practice was to, was a serious offense, but it taught law, it taught loose behavior, and loose behavior once it had spread enough would threaten the religion. This is the reason Jesus was committing a committing a great offense by breaking their law. In their minds, he was weakening their religion and threatening their nation. The religious were men who had profession, position, recognition, esteem, livelihood, and security. Anyone who went contrary to what they believed and taught was a threat to all they had. Some religious undoubtedly felt that Jesus was a threat to them. Every time Jesus broke their law, he was undermining their very position and security. Now, the error of the, the religious leaders were fourfold. They mis misinterpreted and corrupted God's law. They commit serious sins after serious sins in God's eyes. They rejected God's way of righteousness, God's Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. They allow religion in its traditions and rituals to become more important than meeting the basic needs of human life, the need for God and the need for spiritual, mental, and physical health. Christ being the true Messiah was bound to expose such area. Error. Thus, the battle lines were drawn between them. The Messiah knew that he had to liberate people from such enslavement behavior. He had to save them so they could worship God in freedom of spirit. The religious felt that they had to uphold 
oppose Christ because he was a threat to their nation and to their own personal position and security. The religious attack took two forms with Jesus Christ. First, they tried to discredit Christ to the multitudes and stop him from, stop the people from following him. And that was a part of their process. In Matthew 22, they asked Jesus, you know, should we give tribute to Caesar? Jesus said, I'll tell you what, do you have a coin? Whose inscription is on the coin? They said Caesar. So Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and render unto God the things that belong to God. The second way was, in failing to discredit Jesus, they sought some way that they could kill him. That's so verse 14 comes in. The Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. Isn't that something? Luke 22 and 2 says, and the chief priests and scribes saw how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Wow. Ain't that so? Something else in the church will pay. When they can't get their way one way, they're going to try something else. Now, let's go down to verse 11. Now, let's read verse 11 together. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on a Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? The truth was illustrated to prove that man is greater than religion. That's what this was about. Jesus asked, if a man had only one sheep, and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath day, would the man not rescue it? Imagine the force of the Lord's force. It shows just how unreasonable and illogical the religious were in their thinking. It exposed them as ignorant and blind to real spiritual truth. The Lord's question has two points. The one is an animal welfare, not put before religious rules. Is a man not of more value than an animal? There are two important questions. There are, there are two important questions that needs to be asked. Questions that should search our heart. Is an animal of more value than a man and his need? Can man, rituals in order, ever be said to be of more value than the compassion or man? How deceived and irresponsible we are so often, we often live and act. How often we oppose Jesus Christ and his true mission just as the religious of his day opposed him. And we do it for the same reason. We uh, have animals today that are put before reaching men and meeting his need. The animals of religious rituals and rules and of personal position and security. The truth needs to be known and lived. Priorities need to be established. Man is not only more, more rational than animal, he has a spirit capable of worshiping and living forever with God. Animals are not spiritual beings. Therefore, man and his needs should be placed before animals. If a person has a problem with this fact, it reveals a deceived heart and a blinded mind. How many of us follow religion from before reaching out to man and meeting his need? How many of us have deceived hearts and blinded minds in our own practice of religion? All right. Go to verse 12. Let's look at verse 12. Now, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is, a, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. The truth was stated. Christ said that doing good for man supersedes religion and Sabbath rules. We are to help a person who has need before we worry about keeping the ritual and rule of religion. There are many ways for us to go about doing good on the Sabbath day, such as worshiping visiting the lost and the needy, feeding the homework, by bringing others to worship, helping those caught in unex unexpected distress, caring for those who are sick and hurting. That's a part of our responsibility. It supersedes the rituals and rules of religion. Ah, look at verse 13. Then said he to the man, 
stretched forth thy hand, and he stretched forth, and it was restored whole as the other. This is where the truth is being demonstrated. Man and his needs are put before the Sabbath and the religious rule. Man is greater. He is much more important. Jesus healed the man. Jesus demonstrate, demonstrated in no uncertain terms that there is nothing more sacred to God than man. Man is to be reached and brought into a personal relationship with him. Man is to be helped and brought into a state of abundant living as much as possible. What a lesson for us as we reach out to lead man to God week by week and day by day. How much we need to correct our deceived hearts and blinded minds. How much we need to be free from being enslaved to our religious order and form and our own personal, our own personal position and security. We live only a short time and then we shall give an account to God. We have only a few short years to be at be, be about the task of the Lord. Christ gave us an important lesson here. We are to put man and his needs before our religious practice and our personal security. We are not to let our fears stop us. Uh, and finally, verse 14 as we close. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. In response to this display of compassion, power, and wisdom, the Pharisees in the hardness of their heart did not respond in reverence and worship and submission, but in hardness and murderous rejection. This is a significant development in the opposition against Jesus from the religious leader. Hitherto, they had been content with finding fault. Now it is coming to plotting against his life. What a tribute to the power of Jesus Christ. He is just that much of a threat to them. I wonder how many people are you a threat to? Oh, I guess not. Oh, my God. Oh, my. That, that's, that's the tenth miracle. On next week, we will look at the eleventh miracle of Jesus Christ, which deals with Jesus raising the widow's son. And we'll continue to study the 37 miracles of Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll be back Friday on Zoom at 6 o'clock. Uh, I will invite you to come, invite your friends and your families to come and take part and share in this time of fellowshipping with one another. It's just a time for us to fellowship and to laugh with one another. And when you come, bring two jokes along with you so we all can share and laugh with one another. This is truly a blessed time of just sharing with one another, and, and, and I look forward to that every single week, and I know that the Lord is good, and he's going to bless it. I'm looking forward to having a blessed time in the Lord on Friday. I want you to like the video, I want you to share the video, because it's our heart's desire to not just to reach here, but we want to reach the entire world for Jesus Christ, and you like it and share the video. It's one of the ways that we can continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the entire world. Because that is our heart desire. We may not be able to go to the other side of the world, but we can share it on video. We can share it on YouTube. We can share it on Facebook. We can share it on Twitter. Uh, however you choose to share it, we just want you to share this with others so that we can continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. And if the Lord says the same, we'll be talking about through the blood of Jesus. Come and see. It is our communion Sunday. We're going to break the bread of life together, and we're going to share around the fellowship table with you and I together, and just do it in the obedience of Christ, and we're going to have a wonderful time in the spirit on Sunday. I just believe the Lord's going to bless like never before, and I don't want you to miss it. Now, may the Spirit of God bless you.